not going through? Yeah, good. Uh, yeah, I'm back on stage again. Hi. Um, I'm Niall, I'm a Qtis developer, but kind of more relevant for this talk is I'm also the founder of a company called North Road Consulting. Um, and that's what I'm going to talk about today. So in the program, official talk title was, how did I get here? How could you get here? And kind of the most, I guess, you know, the million dollar question is, would you even want to get sort of where North Road is, you know, where I kind of am today? A uh, couple of disclaimers before I start. So first off, I, I really want to stress that these, uh, these are just my experiences from North Road. So I'm not like a MBA trained businessman. Uh, I hate wearing a suit. Um, I never wear a tie if I can avoid it. Um, I don't have like a formal education in business management. So I kind of want to share my experiences, um, but I'd like to stress that there's like heaps of different ways. There's heaps of different businesses making money from open source. They all have different approaches. They uh, have vastly different experiences. Um, there's lots of different ways that you can go about this. Disclaimer number two. Um, in this talk, it's not about kind of business management in general. So I'm not going to talk about you know, staff hiring or HR and all that kind of stuff. Um, this is like talking about how open source changes the approach to running a business. I'll give you a bit of background first. So what does North Road do? Uh, we do about kind of 20% what you'd class as maybe traditional sort of spatial services. So that's things like cartography or um, you know, spatial data services or kind of data transformation, that bread and butter spatial stuff. Um, but then there's this big sort of 80% that we do that's uh, related to software services. So that is things like uh, open source software development, uh, QGIS plugins, training, deployment, enterprise support, that kind of stuff. So things around the software itself. What kind of open source do we use? Probably the Easy answer is we use Qtis, um, but we also kind of use, so we use GDAL and all those other core spatial libraries and frameworks, um, Postgres, Postgres. Uh, when we're doing mapping and especially the cartography stuff, we use a lot of Inkscape, um, also GIMP, and then on the software development side, when we're doing software development, a lot of it is using this open source Qt framework and Python and PyQt. Lots of other ones as well, they're kind of the highlights. What do we use open source for? We use it for a product and we use it for a tool. So when we're doing our software services, open source is the product. So it's a like, core integral part of, of what we're offering with that. Um, basically, to put it really crudely, we're selling that software. To use an example, like the more attractive that QGIS becomes, the more that organizations rely on it and the, the more they use it, and then they depend on our services relating to that software, so relating to QGIS. So this, this kind of aspect of our business about software services, this is like dependent and it relies on these open source projects being viable, so they have to be kind of long-term viable uh, they have to be attractive and they have to be a, like a legitimate competitor to what else is out there. And by that, I mean like the kind of commercial closed source offerings. When we are doing spatial services, we use open source as a tool. So it's something that is kind of behind the scenes. The customers generally don't really care what we use when we're doing that. Uh, it's kind of like an implementation detail, uh, to put it a different way, it's, you know, it's abstracted away, hidden in the background. Um, for us, it's important. We choose to use open source because it lets us get the job done faster and we think gets better results, you know, better products, um, but it doesn't depend on open source. We choose to use it because we think it's better. How does North Road make money? Um, I, I'm just gonna set aside the kind of spatial services part of this because that's sort of like the easy answer. Um, so focusing instead on how, how do we make money from open source as a product, so not as a tool, as a product couple of answers to that one. So one way is selling the services that kind of surround open source software. So training uh, enterprise support where like a, an organization is deploying QGIS and they need someone they can call up on the phone when things go wrong or when their staff have questions. Uh, and then things like plugins. So implementing 
organization, so it's specific business logic as a plugin. If we're talking about, we also get paid to develop the software itself. So this comes from a couple of different uh, avenues. So one is direct end user contracts. So that would be like an end user organization who asks us to like fix something in the software, optimize something in the software, add something to the software, and it's basically like a you know fixed price contract or whatever. Uh, there's also quite a few grants out there for working on open source software. So Qgis.org has a bunch of grants that you can do for maintenance level stuff. They also have a program where they pay people to fix bugs leading up to a release. Um, and if you were in the QGIS Free to Frenzy talk, we recently had a, Cesium, a grant from Cesium to, to work on QGIS. Uh, the other way is we do a fair amount of crowdfunding. So crowdfunding is when we see an opportunity to improve the software in some way, and we kind of just put it out there and say, hey, we'd like to do this, we need this much money, um, you guys make it happen, and then we'll do it. Lastly, we also have some sort of mixed license software. So uh, one of our offerings is a tool called Slayer. lets you get Esri uh, documents, turn them into QGIS, and you get kind of like one-to-one pixel-perfect conversions. Um, this one we do under a mixed license. So we have like a, a licensed version that people need to pay for, and we have a community open source one. Um, but because we're kind of open source focused, we have this thing called our open source pledge, where as soon as we hit certain funding milestones, the functionality goes from that licensed version back to your community. And the kind of long-term goal is the whole thing will just become open source. All right, how did we get here? Uh, this is my story, basically. I put that slide there because I hate it and I wanted to troll myself. Um, now, I was working in Victoria Police in this thing called the Spatial Intelligence Unit. Um, and our role there was we had to make intelligence products to inform policing decisions uh, based on spatial and time-based factors. Uh, it was a really cool job. We had heaps of flexibility in those roles. Um, so we could kind of pick the products that we wanted to do. Like if we saw an opportunity, we're like, hey, we've read about this, we want to do it now. Um, and also we could pick the, the tools we used, the software we used. Uh, had lots of flexibility, but it was government and we did not have much software budget. So, I was drawn at first to open source geo for practical reasons, for the cost, being zero, um, but also because of the features. So at the time, we're looking a long time ago, 2013, 2012, uh, QGIS had some stuff that I really wanted to use in my maps, some, some features, uh, and that drew me to open source. Uh, through need, I started to contribute to that project. So I was using QGIS and, you know, maybe selfishly, but in a good way, um, I'd have things I wanted to fix because they were affecting me. So something like this, like uh, that was actually my first contribution to QGIS. This became a bit of a hobby for me. So what I mean by that is I was, I had my day job at the police. I'd catch a train there on my laptop. I'd be hacking away at QGIS. I'd spend the day using QGIS and open source uh, doing my work. Um, then on the train on the way home, I'd kind of like have this mentality of like, what was the worst part of my day using this software? And like, is there any way I can quickly fix something in this hour train ride home to make my day tomorrow better? So, you know, maybe I could put in a button that makes that process faster. Did that for a while, got invited to be part of the QGIS core team. Um, and then I got this email. So up to then it was all hobby. I got an email from someone out of the blue and they were basically like, we use QGIS, we've been seeing what you're doing in the the print layout composer thing, um, and we like it. We have a similar need. Can you let us know how much it would cost for us to have this feature developed? Um, I was really green when I got that email. So I'd been involved in open source, but I didn't really know much about it. I was kind of like using the software, developing the software. That was as far as I went. Um, and I got this email and I was like really conflicted. I was like, I don't know what to do with this. It's actually a really cool idea. Like. I want that myself, I'm gonna use that myself. I'd probably just develop it for free because I, you know, selfishly, I want that. Um, but then I was also like, oh, but maybe like, you know, I could get 200 bucks and then I could like go and buy something guilt-free and like, whatever. Um, so I was like, I don't know how to answer this. Uh, I'll just say $200 and whatever. Um, and I sent off this email to him and then like I had a sleepless night. So he was in Europe and you know, there's a time zone thing, so uh, I sent an email off and then I went to sleep. And like, I was really sleepless, so I was like, 
am I going to wake up now and it's going to have come out that I like asked for money to work on open source and like I'll be kicked off the project and people will be like, you traitor. You know? <laughs> <laughs> and so I wake up the next day and I like hesitantly kind of check my email and there was an email from him. And the email was basically like this, it was like, are you sure? Can you recheck your numbers? Because that looks really low. <laughs> um, and just like to put it in perspective, if I was asked to do that job today, uh, it's kind of like a 20,000, 30,000 euro job. But you know, I got, <laughs> I, I put my price up to $250 and you know. <laughs> <laughs> so, so that was my kind of first foray into making money off open source. That was kind of here. So that was about 2013. Um, I got more and more of those contracts and I kind of learnt more, but actually this is normal, this is okay, you know, it's fine to get paid for the work you do. This is kind of more or less when uh, I became sort of full-time North Road uh, open source focused. So up to then I was kind of working part-time and such and had like a, a backup safety net. Um, actually this big spike here, this was Fugis 3.0, so there was a massive like flurry of activity, oh that's really hard to read, um, across the whole project. So massive focus on Fugis. A um, couple of things that I just want to pull out of that little story. So first off, uh, the North Road was kind of organic. So it wasn't like a something that was designed. You know, somebody came along and was like, I can see an opportunity to make money here and monetize open source. This is how we're going to do it. Uh, secondly, so North Road is, was, is still uh, a vehicle to make open source better. So that's kind of the, the, you know, the mission. Um, and through there to make the world better. Um, okay, here's kind of the question that you probably want to know. It's like, how, go, how can you, how can you guys make money off open source? Can you make money off software contracting in open source? Is software contracting a viable business model? So, so by this, I'm talking about things like uh, developing open source. So getting things like those Fugis grants, the Cesium grants, um, you know, getting a part of those GDAL funds that is getting pledged by various organizations to work on GDAL, or like uh, you know, a piece of that blender bucket, the massive blender budget that they get every year. The answer is yes, kind of. Um, yes, you can, that's a short answer, but you gotta be prepared for a really long lead time for this. Uh, and the reason is that these projects that actually have funds available for grants and such, the good news is that's increasing, like there's more and more of those. Um, but they generally will give these funds and they'll dedicate those funds to people that they know and trust. Uh, so it takes a long time to get involved in a project and to build up that trust uh, and contributions to kind of earn that, those funds. What else can you do? Uh, an easy one, you can use open source as a tool. So 100% yes, you can make money, you can use open source as a tool, you can do any kind of spatial data related service uh, using open source or a mix and your clients won't care. If they do care, there's solutions out there and they're mature solutions. You can make money from open source services, 100% yes. Uh, open source use, it's growing, like there's lots of metrics out there to prove that. There is demand for enterprise support and training and that around open source. And honestly, like the more of that demand that's met, the more it grows, those projects, and it makes them more trustworthy from an end user organization perspective if they see there's multiple options for support and for training and services. So it basically grows the whole ecosystem the more that that demand is met. What about developing a whole new open source product? Is that a viable business model? Um, yes, you can. There's a massive history of that, uh, of people who make open source products, businesses make them, and then they sell the services around that or they sell the software itself because that's not incompatible with open source. Um, but the but there is obviously there's like considerable risk and startup costs involved in that kind of stuff. Okay, in conclusion, three really practical tips from what we've learned over the, the course of North Road. So number one um, is about delegation. The point here I wanna make is it's really easy to kind of fall into these false economies where you might be like, we've got staff in house who are developers, they could contribute what we need to open source. Um, We've found most of the time it's, it's better just to engage the experts. So if we need something fixed in Inkscape or developed in Inkscape, yes, you know, we could spend weeks learning that project, learning their way of coding, learning their processes, or instead we'll just approach them directly and say, hey, we want to sponsor this, can you do it, are you interested? Same with GDAL, 
If we wanted something really heavy changed in GDAL, we'd go straight to Evan, Evan Ruout, uh, and he'd do it in a fraction of the time that it would take us. Um, number two is contribute. So by this, I want to say, really important to give before you start to take from open source, because no projects appreciate someone just kind of coming in who's not known to that project and starting to monetize it. Um, take it slow, like don't kind of just jump in there gung-ho and just be like, boom, 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 you should do this, you should do this, you should do this. Also, we're selling all your services and training and that. Uh, like learn the culture, go in gently. Um, last one is that unpaid contributions are a necessity, like 100% necessity. A couple of reasons for that. Um, this is gross business speak, but it's marketing and brand awareness. So we do heaps of like unpaid uh, hours on Fugis. Um, we do that because we need that, that product, that project to be viable. But it also means that we've got, got an excuse to like push out goodwill about that of like, hey, we just did this in Fugis, um, you've all got it for free. It's like a kind of giving back thing. It's a really good like self-promotion tool because you're not just saying, hey, you know, employ us, pay us to do something. You're like, we're giving you stuff, you know, we're giving you stuff. We get to be the good guys. Um, construe as a sustainability, really important again, it's kind of risk management. Those products have to be viable for us to make that part of our business work. Uh, and it's not just code, so contributions can be sponsorship, direct financial sponsorship, um, non-code things like documentation, translation, you're still taking away work from the product, so you're helping out those projects, um, but it doesn't have to be code if you don't have that infrastructure, user assistance. Um, events, you know, hey, maybe for Foster to Oceana 2024 would be a good unpaid contribution if you're kind of looking to, to do that. Um, so, again, a disclaimer, these are just my experiences, but as a bit of a segue, we're really lucky to have a full panel of experts just about to take to the stage, um, and they're gonna have a very different experience, so it's gonna be great to hear from them and hear kind of how their experiences ch relate, change, be different. Um, but yeah, thanks for your time. I don't know, is Alex around? Uh, are we doing questions or? What okay. do you reckon? I, I've always I thought if there's questions that are specific to North Road, but we keep all the general okay. open source ones for the panel where there'll be a better Good idea. set of answers. North Road questions? Mike Wilson, yeah. Um, hello, I'm curious if you have any philosophies on the product development of QGIS. Like obviously there's millions of features that people could request. How do you ensure that QGIS doesn't become just a hodgepodge of like a million different things and that there's a coherent product vision? Like, how's that done in an open source project or, or any product, really? Uh, it's a good question. So, QGIS, I think, is, is quite lucky in that there's some very regular contributors who are in there on a day-to-day -day basis reviewing the pull request and that, who have got a real mindset about uh, making sure it has good UX and it looks professional and it, you know, acts professional. Um, so anytime someone kind of sends in something that's a bit half-baked and is like a bit old school open source, if I can kind of say that, you know, like uh, the kind of ugly UI or whatever, um, it generally won't get in. It'll get refined by those suggestions and kind of have to go for quite a lengthy process to actually get in. That's, I guess specific to Fugis. <laughs> um, I know a lot of other businesses who do open source and have and have got like a big open source pro product, project, whatever you want to call it, um, might hire like a UX person dedicated to that to also make sure that there's like a coherent vision. They tend to be those really uh, enterprise backed projects. So something like Blender or coming back into sort of a geo space like merge and input, they also have UX people who are kind of dedicated to making sure that those um, applications look good, work good. Where does the name come from, Niall? <laughs> Does anyone live in Melbourne? 
like, yeah, it's, it's not the North Road of Melbourne because that's like an ugly, gross road. I used to live on it and then I moved and I was like, actually, this name's kind of cool. I'll just kind of not associate it with the traffic on that road. So, yeah, it's, yeah. 